some time ago I was doing some reading in a uh, magazine and I came across an article that talked about the importance of having a bug out bag. Have you ever heard of such a thing? A bug out bag, it's not something to protect you from insects, but it's a, a bag uh, of uh, your valuables and essentials in the event of some natural catastrophe or some other uh, problem that uh, forces you to leave your house quickly, uh, perhaps for a few days, hopefully for no more than three days or so. Uh, but if there were a natural disaster to come through a community, town, a tornado that swept through and knocked over homes and these kinds of things, if you had an opportunity to just simply grab a bag that has all essential things, uh, things like bandages, something to light a fire, uh, hopefully your Bible, and of course you need duct tape. Uh, can't go anywhere without duct tape. But uh, get your essentials in that bag and then quick hop into your car or whatever you can to get out of town and find a place of safety. It's a bug out bag. It could also be called a go bag. It seems that Jeremiah was being instructed to have a go bag ready to go. Uh, it, the Lord shows him the, this image of Israel, or the, the Jews at this time, uh, with the, the armies coming down upon them, <coughs> taking, sacking their city, and the inhabitants of the city having to flee and run for their lives. They have to have their go bag, a bug out bag. Uh, I'm reminded of stories of, of men hobos back in the past with a stick over their shoulder and a bag behind them filled with what they had of their worldly goods. Uh, here is the image of the Jews leaving their city with what they can carry along with them on their shoulder. This is it. We have to go. This is all we have. It's a very solemn image. And one which would, in fact, be played out when uh, their city would be devastated by the Babylonians. As Jeremiah concludes this sermon, it's a rather interesting and different approach to a conclusion that we might have anticipated. You might have thought that he would have said a lot about the coming devastation by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, and he does do that to a certain extent. But it, rather than railing against the, the, the unbelieving apostate Jews in uh, the, the city at that time, you recall he's there at the temple preaching to these crowds that are gathering there at the temple for worship. Um, he has a very solemn conclusion to the sermon, which uh, really, I think, has an address to God's elect within Israel. An address to those who must suffer along with their countrymen as all these things come about. And it's a word that uh, I think reminds them of the calling that we have before the Lord to be humble before the Lord. To humble ourselves before Him and accept that which His hand of providence brings our way. And so Jeremiah is going to, I think, uh, encourage God's people at the conclusion of the sermon to trust in the Lord in the midst of this most difficult, painful uh, affliction that's coming upon them. Trust in the Lord, who is the King of the nations, as we saw last week, the one who orders all things by his word, the one who is true, in whom they can trust and rely upon when everything else is falling apart. This word by the Spirit of Christ is a word to us as well, to trust in the Lord when things are not going right, to trust in him when it seems like uh, everything that you relied upon and depended upon is falling apart. And so, Jeremiah urges the people of God to trust. And you recall, the sermon had as its focus uh, a, a warning to God's elect, really, uh, about the danger of trusting in those who were around you. It was a community that was filled with lies from everywhere you turn, from the top of the, the feeding chain, the, the priests, the prophets, the kings, all of the leaders in Israel, to all the people, they were filled with lies. The uh, worship that they had uh, taken part in, in terms of the, the pagan idols, uh, 
uh, we just saw in the 10th chapter was a delusion and those who followed these idols were stupid because these idols could do nothing for you. They were a falsehood. And so a motivation to be warned against the danger of being deceived is a reminder that these gods in which many were trusting in were nothing but a delusion. And we saw last week that in contrast to the deceptive nature of these false religions, however devout people might be in pursuing them, there is the true God, the living God, who stands before Israel, the one who created the heavens and the earth and ordered all things. If we can go all the way back to the beginning of the sermon and the introduction of the sermon, that which sets the plate for the remainder of the sermon, chapter 7, we find that these themes reoccur and are touched on at the very start. Jeremiah is led by the Spirit of God to warn the people against trusting in things where they should not trust. They shouldn't put a false hope in merely having the presence of God's temple in their midst. And assuming that the mere presence of that temple guarantees and assures them that they will be safe and protected from harm. And so the warning was that even in a religious ritual that was loosely, uh, professedly based on God's revelation, that was not to be trusted in when your life entirely goes contrary to true faith in walking with God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What we have here is uh, now in the conclusion, picking up something that was just lightly touched on at the beginning of this introduction here in chapter 7, where the Lord warns His people that He's going to cast them out of the land, throw them out. And we have that picked up again here at the conclusion of the sermon, where in the English Standard Version, the, the, the translation is, he will sling them out of the land. And it's the, the image of David with his smooth stones and his sling. And he whips it around his head until he lets it go, and then the stone flies away. In that case, hitting the giant Goliath. But here, God says, I'm going to take you, the inhabitants of the land, and put you in my sling, and swing you around and let you go, casting you out of the land. What an amazing, profound change has occurred. Whereas on the one hand, in David, God fights for his people to deliver them from the Goliath that stands before them in their day, to now taking the people themselves and casting them out of his land, all because they had departed from the true God. They would not allow themselves to be ruled by God's word. They set themselves on a path of self-rule. They would live their lives on their own terms. They thought they were wise, but they became fools. So Jeremiah reminds them once more of God's wrath against their sin, the consequences of that in His driving them or expelling them out of the land. You might think as well, in terms of the repercussions of this, back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve committed their sin against God, they lived in the place where God dwelt with His people, the Garden. And because of their sin, He had to expel them from the Garden. They must leave that Garden and here, it's almost as though Israel now, who had dwelt in God's garden once more, in the land of Canaan, where God himself made his temple, they would also be driven out like Adam and Eve, out of his land, disinherited, cast off because of their sin. Brothers and sisters, it is a fearful thing to depart from the living God to depart from the true God and to pursue our own paths. We should heed God's word. Well, Jeremiah, looking at this, cannot help but be moved. We've commented that Jeremiah is often known as the, uh, 
the weeping prophet, one who weeps and mourns over the devastation that is coming to his people. He does not say these things lightly, but with great grief in his heart over what will occur. We find him once more uh, picking up that theme of grief and sorrow as he sees what devastation will come to his people as their tents will be cast down and there will be nobody around to set them up again, to stretch out their cords and reestablish things. The children will be cast off, the children will be gone, driven away. And so in this shepherd image of a tent out on the hillside where shepherd families would gather together and find comfort in the midst of their occupations, Jeremiah says, God will knock down those tents and your families will be scattered about because you've forgotten the Lord and wandered away from Him. A powerful image. And then Jeremiah says, all this because the shepherds of Israel are stupid. They are foolish because they have not consulted the Lord. They went on their own ways. Now he might be thinking about, oftentimes the, the kings of Israel would be described as shepherds. They were the shepherd kings who would be responsible for governing their land. And if they did so in accord with God's word, they were blessed. You look at the history of kings and chronicles. Uh, and, and you find how God blesses those kings who honored his word and sought to abide by it in their rule. They were godly men and their nations prospered for a time. But when the ungodly arose and abandoned God's word and filled the land with idols and idol worship, then God's wrath came upon them and God's judgments occurred. It's a similar pattern you find in the book of Judges. Uh, a great leader comes and leads God's people. They establish a righteous period of time and then they depart from the Lord, expand in wickedness and God's judgments come upon them. And then in time, God raises up a deliverer to rescue his people. There are these cycles that occur in history and time. But the warning is that when we depart from the Lord, his wrath comes in a powerful way. And the departure comes when we do not inquire of the Lord. When you're sitting down making decisions for your life, when you're considering uh, this and that, whether it's where to live, what job to have, um, or just very simple things about your day, how you're going to order your day, do you inquire of the Lord about what needs to be done for this day? Do you ask Him for guidance for particular troubles in life or challenges that you might have for your day? Do you pray that God will guide you and lead you? Do you look to the Scriptures and examine them to see perhaps what guidance might be there for you in this particular decision that you need to make? And sometimes it may not be just specifically looking for what God's Word has to say about how to organize your financial affairs. But maybe it's just reading the scriptures in general and being reminded of who God is and being reminded you, that you can trust in Him in the midst of financial problems and troubles or whatever problem might be that's before you at the, that moment in time. Go to the scriptures, inquire of the Lord, seek His counsel, seek His fellowship so that you might prosper and do well. So Jeremiah brings this uh, to the attention of his people as he concludes. And, and, and as I see Jeremiah weeping over his people and what's going to come their way, I cannot help but think that what we have here is not just Jeremiah, a man of emotion, a man of uh, a sensitivity, uh, concerned about his people and what he sees will happen to them. But what we have in Jeremiah is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ himself who inspires Jeremiah to see these things and strengthens him to feel these things. Remember Peter, the first chapter of his letter, 1 Peter, talks about how the prophets, when they 
uh, foretold the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, uh, did so by the, the Spirit of Christ who was within them, teaching them these things. The prophets didn't speak on their own, merely out of their human souls as they tried to deal with an outward revelation to them. But the Spirit of Christ was within them, at work in them. And the Spirit of Christ is a Spirit who has compassion for His people. He is one who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The writer to the Hebrews says that He is our great high priest who came into this world and took on our flesh and in our flesh suffered many things and has now passed on into glory, into His heavenly throne, and He's not forgotten us, but He continues to be our sympathetic high priest who understands your situation in life and His compassion, gracious, weeping over the things that occur in life. So Jeremiah sees the by the power of the Spirit of Christ, the great troubles that would occur. He sees the, the, the coming of the Chaldeans, and, and he says in this comment to the people, uh, you know, you didn't listen to the prophets that I sent to you. They came and they preached, and they preached clearly, effectively, powerfully. I, I mean, take a look at what Jeremiah's had to say here. Think of Isaiah in the past, and put those two prophets before you and read their sermons. See how powerful those sermons are. How they pled with their people and argued and persuaded with them. And yet what happened? They would not listen to them. They closed off their ears. They insisted on going their own ways. And what does God say? God will not be ignored. He will not allow these people to just go on their way and pay no attention to Him. And so he says, in effect, since you would not listen to my prophets who brought my word to you regularly, I will make sure you listen in a different way. I will make you feel the intensity or the truth of what I am saying at the hands of the Chaldeans. When the Babylonians come and put into effect that which, that which I have warned you of, then you will feel firsthand the message that I am bringing to you. Let us not find ourselves in that position where we have steadfastly refused to heed God's word and put, as it were, blinders on our eyes and, and pursued one particular path without heeding what God has to say. Lest we find ourselves having God bring severe judgments into our lives. Which brings us to the next part of Jeremiah's conclusion here. After grieving over the circumstances that are coming to the way of his people, he then reflects on these things. And he says, I know that it's not in a man's way is not I know that it's not in man to direct his ways. Men don't, men presume that they think they have their life under control. They think that they have a plan laid out and, and things are going to work, go pretty well the way they expect. And so they work their plan. They plan their work, they work their plan. You sit down with a group of businessmen and they're going to say, well, we're going to go into the city of Dallas and we're going to set up a, a restaurant there and we're going to have a great clientele because we have an attractive uh, many to present to them. We're going to bring to them Scottish food. Have you ever tried Scottish food? <laughs> Being a Scotsman, I can say, maybe, maybe you want to try something else. But you can have... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you can have great plans and expectations about what you're going to do, but in the end, Things are not in your control. People might not like haggish. <laughs> might not. So, 
heed what Jeremiah, or excuse me, James said many years after when he counseled God's people. He said, don't say we'll go to this place and that place, but say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this and we'll do that. All of life is lived out before a sovereign God who ordains all that takes place. Solomon in the Proverbs says that a, a, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. There's so much truth to that. And so we must always be pre prepared to say that whatever plans we may make, and it's not that you should not make plans, you should, but always make them before the Lord with the recognition that He in His sovereign, wise providence may direct your path in ways that you did not plan to go. I think of Jesus meeting with Peter after the resurrection, and they're alongside that lake, and um, He talks to him about going to a place where you did not want to go. And Peter would have to be put to death, crucified, in view of his faith in Jesus. Life does not always go the way you had planned or expected. God is pleased to let his people pass through affliction. Very hard, difficult times. And he has a sovereign, gracious, wise purpose for it all. It may be hard to understand. It may be hard to endure. But faith looks up to a good, gracious, sovereign God and trusts Him for those things that we do not know or understand. And we know that when we gather before His stone, He will explain those things to us more fully. The Lord is the one who is in sovereign control of the affairs of men. And we should commit our ways to Him. Our prayer will be that God and His fatherly care for us will not judge us along with the rest of the nations. Look at how Jeremiah speaks of the rest of the nations here. Uh, he's going to pray that God and His wrath would visit these uh, foreign nations, those who are hostile to God and hostile to His people, who bring great havoc into the lives of the people of God and bring all this disruption, despair, and struggle into their lives, God is not unmindful of your sufferings. He will not allow those who, take, who abuse you, who afflict you, who harm you, to go unpunished. I think of those uh, many Christian people in the Middle East who have lost their homes, loved ones, uh, their churches, their jobs, in view of their faith in Jesus Christ. I think of those who have been paraded out onto a beach in orange jumpsuits and have had their lives taken from them by these wicked, murderous men. God will not be mocked. He will visit the wicked in His day of wrath. And judgment will come. And it is part of our prayers that God would judge the wicked. The enemies of the church must be destroyed. And we should pray for that. Now, we need to take that into some context. We should love our enemies, do good to them who abuse us and persecute us, turn the other cheek as best as we can. We should pray for those who abuse us. Our desire is for the salvation of those who are outside of Christ that they will be saved. And we follow the example of God Himself, who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, how do I reconcile these things? Well, we don't understand or know who among the wicked are yet among God's elect. And our prayer is that God would bring repentance to many and bring them to Himself. But those who are hardened in their resistance against God, who are committed to uh, opposing God, and God knows who they are, just as He knows who God's elect are, who are yet perhaps not yet saved, we pray that God would judge the wicked. Remember Paul's words to the Thessalonians, and I believe it's the second 
epistle where he talks about it is a just thing for God to visit those who wickedly oppress you with his flaming wrath. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So Jeremiah is not afraid, he's not weak about praying for the judgment that would occur upon the wicked. But he's also, remember, the one who mourns and grieves over the devastation of those who are around him. And so he prays. He prays Finally, that the Lord would not judge him according to his great wrath, but judge him with justice. And the sense there is, I think all of us would be a little bit concerned about being judged with justice. <laughs> we don't quite want the full measure of justice in our lives. We want mercy and grace and forgiveness. I think what Jeremiah has in mind here is more uh, the, the discipline of a father who comes and justly disciplines us for where we have fallen astray so that we might be perfected, made more holy. And the godly child of God recognizes his fatherly love and care and sees all the discipline that he endures in life and sees it as a reflection of God's love for him. Remember how the writer to the Hebrews makes that plain in the 12th chapter in a, wonderful text where he, he first highlights in the 11th chapter the many saints of God who bear witness to us of faith and trust in God and all the circumstances of life, all the sufferings and afflictions of life. And then in the 12th chapter he begins by saying, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. Jesus is the one who has endured affliction. Jesus is the one who has passed through this life and endured mockings, scourgings, crucifixion for you and I. And so we should fix, as God's people, our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured these many things and followed by faith in Him in the midst of all these troubles, knowing that there is, just as there was joy for Him, there's joy for us if we obey. And how do we deal with the afflictions in life? Well, the writer goes on to say that God is our Father who disciplines us according to His great love that we might endure and be made more perfect. Because God loves us, He disciplines us. We don't discipline another man's children. We discipline our own children. And the mark of a child of God is that we're disciplined. And various hardships, troubles in life, God disciplines us so that we might know that He loves us. And so Jeremiah concludes his sermon with this note of faith in the God who is the true God, whom we can rest in and trust in, even when the whole world is falling apart all around us. We can rest in Him and trust Him to bring us through this life and to bring us safely home. Do you rest in this one who loves you, cares for you, and has done everything for you? for your good. That's right. Father, we thank you for your love for your children, and we thank you that though we face many hardships and difficulties in life, sometimes we are afflicted in our families, sometimes there's hostility between husbands and wives, parents and children, perhaps there's affliction within the church or within the state, the community in which we live. Many different ways in which we suffer many things in this life. Help us in the midst of these things, O oh Lord, to cast all our cares and anxieties upon you because you care for us. And may that trust and reliance upon you in the midst of all these things strengthen us to endure affliction, to receive your hand of discipline, and to walk humbly before you.
We pray it in Jesus' name.